Excellent. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to see you all here in person. My name is Eve Patton. I'm director of the Trinity Long Room Hub. Uh, and I'm welcoming you, and I'm also welcoming many people joining us on Facebook to watch the live stream of this conversation which we've been looking forward to for several weeks now because uh, I'm delighted to have with us uh, Rashid Khalidi who joins us for this fellow in focus conversation. Uh, he is one of those few people who really doesn't need an introduction but let me give a brief introduction to him anyway. I know that many people here already know him or have met him but uh, for those of you who haven't, Rashid is the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University, uh, where he served as chair of the History Department and director of the Middle East Institute. Uh, he holds uh, his BA from uh, Yale, his PhD from Oxford. He has taught at many uh, international and highly esteemed universities. Uh, he's co-editor of the Journal of Palestine Studies and was president of the Middle East Studies Association and, of course, of great interest to us, was an advisor to the Palestinian delegation to uh, Madrid and to the Washington Arab-Israeli peace negotiations. This was back between 91 and 93, uh, Rashid. Uh, and uh, of that era of uh, shuttle diplomacy, um, he's written on how being at the coalface of those negotiations, and I quote, revealed how rapidly views of self and other of history and of time and space could shift in situations of extreme political stress, which could be seen as watersheds in terms of identity. And I, I, I like quoting that partly because one of the things that may come up in our conversation today is this idea of watersheds in historical timelines, and particularly the timelines that Rashid has been looking at. Uh, he has received, as many of you will know, fellowships and grants from numerous prestigious organizations around the world. He's written uh, over 100 scholarly articles and book chapters on Middle Eastern history and politics, many, many opinion pieces across the international media landscape. And of course, he is the author of several books. And I would note that some of these are specifically, as he's written, uh, uh, published for an, a broad non-specialist audience in the belief that the history of Palestine and of post-colonial nationalism generally needs to be made familiar and accessible to a broad readership and audience. His books include Palestinian Identity, The Construction of Modern National Consciousness, that was 1997, reissued in 2010, uh, The Iron Cage, The Story of the Palestinian Struggle for Statehood, 2006. I'm selecting uh, a very, from a very long list here. Uh, and then, of course, most recently from 2020, the Hundred Years' War on Palestine. I'm going to hold that up, but many of you will have it already. A History of Settler Colonial Conquest and Resistance. Uh, in the Trinity Long Room Hub over the past few weeks, Rashid has joined us to look further at the parallels and uh, the similarities between the colonial administration of Ireland and Palestine. In the Hundred Years' War, he writes that the first most promising way to comprehend Palestine reality is, and I quote, the fertile comparison of the case of Palestine to other settler colonial experiences, whether that of Native Americans or South Africans or the Irish. But how is that comparative process to be fine-tuned to avoid what we're all familiar with as sledgehammer analogies? How is it to be made a useful and a viable point of historical and political inquiry? And I know that that's a subject that I, I, our questions are likely to touch on today. So what we're going to do, uh, Rashid, is uh, I'll ask a few general questions about your career as a researcher and a historian. Uh, and then, uh, after about 20 minutes or so, we'll open up to the room and see what questions and, and comments people have for you. Um, so, first of all, welcome, and uh, many thanks for taking this conversation. And I, I thought I would begin uh, very broadly, Rashid, by asking you about how you see yourself as a historian. One of the um, practices that we see in your books is 
but you draw uh, very often on your own family's history in order to foreground the kind of narratives uh, that you work on. So history to you is obviously a personal subject, but clearly you're responding very much to wider international political pressures, so it's a public subject. You've written about yourself as a historian, as an interpreter of voices. You obviously feel a sense of responsibility to the voices of history in what you do. I wonder, could you tell us a little bit about your journey as a historian and how you see the, the kind of ethics of your role? Well, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Eve, for, for, first of all, for hosting me here. To you and to all your colleagues, it's been a wonderful experience and the hospitality has been amazing. Sorry, Rashid, I'm going to check it. Is it not? It's off. I think it is working. Oh, yeah. Should I raise my voice? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll pretend I'm in a lecture hall and your students. And I'll bellow. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Eve and all of her colleagues for their hospitality here. I mean, it was a wonderful example of Irish hospitality. Amazing. And uh, uh, I, I, I benefited enormously from it. Um, to answer your questions, because there are two or three of them there, um, I suppose I came to see my, my role as a historian from a, a couple of angles and for a couple of reasons. W one of them was growing up in the United States um, with a family around me that was very involved in history as it was unfolding. I had a father who worked at the United Nations in the Security Council and his job was to chronicle and follow developments in the Middle East. And so that was dinner table discussion. And we would travel to the Middle East and see people and hear things um, at the same time. So part of it started out from family and with family and, and from personal experiences. Um, growing up in the United States as a Palestinian meant being, by definition, unpopular and even unmentionable. The word was not how shall I say, something that was used in polite company, Palestine, Palestinian, and so forth. Um, and so it was a bit of an uphill struggle, uh, simply to express an identity. Um, and I think that also drove me to want to consider history as more than something just for other historians, but rather as something, as you suggest about some of my books, something that should be directed at a broader audience. I really think that and I try and teach this to my dozens and dozens of the dozens and dozens of PhD students that I've mentored over the decades, that it's really important that they learn to speak to more than just an academic audience, that it's really important that they learn to speak to broader audiences. So I've always felt this partly because of my experience in the United States. And on that journey, Rashid, who do you carry with you in terms of mentors, hmm. uh, historical voices uh, from other authorities, one of the things that people will, will see on reading your books is that you, you go automatically to theorists of nationalism, for example, mm -hmm. that we all draw on. You go right. back to Hobsbawm, you go back to Gellner, but you also look to contemporary subaltern critics. And of course, you are the Edward Said professor, uh, a, a name that I suppose one does not carry lightly. There's the, the weight of a huge authority there, uh, certainly for, for my generation coming to scholarship. Who guides you in terms of these, these historical authorities? Well, I mean, in, in addition to the people that you've mentioned, uh, including Edward Said and including uh, uh, Anderson, Gellner, Hobsbawm, all of those theorists of nationalism, and some of the writers of the Subaltern School. Um, I'm very much influenced by the voices of some of the sources that I've read. And, some of which I, I, I cite in this book and have cited in earlier work. Um, the people who wrote in the newspapers in Palestine in the, in the first half of the 20th century, for example. Um, my wife's uh, uh, grandfather who was the editor of a newspaper. Um, one of my uncles, whom I cite here. Um, and a number of other important figures. Uh, Abdul Qadir Hussein. I could, I could mention voices from this history, which who, none of whom were historians, of course as well, I guess, as my father's voice, as people who, in addition to the theorists you mentioned, uh, I think have influenced the way I think about this history. I would also add some of the people who taught me, Albert Harani, uh, Roger Owen, 
at Oxford, um, and other people whom I've learned from over the years in the Middle East field, including in many cases my own students. Um, I, 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 am, I learn probably more from my students than I learn from my, my graduate mentors um, over the years. Uh, and I hope I reflect that in my work. And this is, I mean, it's a challenge. You, one of the things you, you talk about, uh, I think, in, in the latest book is avoiding being trapped simply in the elite voices yeah. that give historical authority. How do you get beyond them to, to the popular, to the subaltern, particularly in the field that you're working in, where I know that a lot of the uh, historical material and political analysis is carried by those in the academy. Right. Um, how do you get outside that? In terms of grassroots research, how do you get back to the voices that right. are the other side of that elitism? I had a, 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 what I thought was a, a seminal experience at a conference at Columbia in the early 1980s when um, we were working, it was a conference on early Arab nationalism. And there were a number of scholars there who argued you cannot listen to a certain set of voices, that you couldn't use the press wasn't representative, you couldn't find out anything through that, you had to use a certain set of elite sources about Arab nationalism, um, the published works of the major figures uh, in, that, in that period. And we had a huge debate at the conference over this. And I said, no, the only way to reach the people who are moved or not moved by Arab nationalism or by any other, any other political phenomenon is through, since we can't interview them in 1908, they were dead. Um, is through the press and similar and similar sources. I mean, court records and so on are also are also um, valuable. Um, and I think that that was in that was that sense of needing to go to a different set and different kind of sources was reinforced by my experience in Beirut, where we lived for twelve or fifteen. I lived for more than fifteen years, and all my kids were born. And I was deeply involved in politics. I was deeply involved in journalism. Uh, and I was transcribing and translating and, and, and conveying uh, not just the writings of leaderships, but also what was being said and, 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 and discussed uh, among Palestinians and Lebanese during this period of the Lebanese war from the early 70s right up to when we left in 1983. And I think that, too, had an impact on my sense of what voices had to be conveyed. It wasn't enough to talk about international diplomacy or whatever or international law it was necessary to talk about what people were actually talking about on the ground. I wrote a book um, under siege about Palestinian decision making during the 1982 war, during the siege of Beirut, the Israeli siege of Beirut, which I hope reflects some of those voices, though much of it is, is, is high politics as well. Uh, so it's all of the, I think all of those things together. And I hope this isn't a, an impertinent question, but, but given the material that you recount in your books, particularly that period of, of uh, being at, at the forefront of negotiations in the early 90s, do you think that you are a different historian necessarily in the US because of the political context that you find yourself in, because of current uh, US perspectives on Israel, uh, on the Middle East more broadly, I mean, because you, you have worked, I suppose, in a bifurcated way, if that's the expression, are you two different historians as a result? I, 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 that's a hard question to answer here. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you might be right. I don't know. Um, I do know that I think I'm a different kind of observer than people who've never been involved politically who've never been involved in historical processes. I'm not saying that I was a major actor. I was, I, was, I was at least a witness and sometimes involved. And I think that for people who think that politics is academic politics, there should be another think coming. Uh, in other words, for, for people who have never been outside the academy and then who write about uh, 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 political history or social or any other kind of history, um, there are things they can do. And there are things that I think, frankly, they cannot do because they haven't themselves in some way been involved. Now, there are problems with that. There are problems of partisanship. There are problems of, 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 of uh, an inability to see certain things because you yourself have been involved. But I think that I've benefited. Um, and I try and convey some of this in this book um, because I frankly think that if one simply looks at a negotiation, as I look at the negotiations I was involved in, or one looks at a set of events like the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 82, um, 
from the vantage point of high politics, one misses almost everything that's important. Um, so I think that having been there has helped me. I, you know, I was working on diplomatic history as a as a as a as a PhD as a DPhil student at, at Oxford. I had no idea until I was involved in negotiations how much more there was to these things. Um, similarly, I wrote about war and I wrote about things like that earlier in, in my career until I was being bombarded by air, sea, and land. I don't think I fully understood war. I'm not suggesting you should all go out and be bombarded, but, but it, it helps to get a perspective on some of these things. And I, I think that's why I was interested in that, that quote I gave earlier about how quickly things can change when you are literally under that kind of pressure and how different uh, perspectives can emerge. Uh, but I want to draw back a bit. We're, we're going to maneuver around, uh, obviously, to Palestine and Ireland uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the relationship between them. But I want to come to it through the angle of how we situate ourselves in terms of being researchers. Uh, because many people in this room, and I know many people joining us on Facebook, uh, work like myself in the broad field of what we call Irish studies. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you do within Irish studies, and no matter what period you work in, you're never that far away from the political horizon. Now, you have been foundational in the field of Palestine studies. Uh, you've, in a sense, helped create that as a field of study. Um, and obviously, I, I assume that, I'm going to badly paraphrase uh, Heaney, you do feel the hand of a contemporary history on your shoulder at all times, even when you're working on material which is historically distant, which might be in terms of content uh, distant from that political front line. How much are you aware of a contemporary politics driving the agenda of what you do as a historian? And if that's a crude question, please tackle it uh, from whatever way you think is appropriate. And I'm asking on behalf of my Irish studies colleagues and colleagues who I think uh, perhaps have become, like myself, sometimes a bit less aware of this connection in recent years than we used to be. That's really a very good question. Um, I, 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 I think that one has to sometimes resist the temptation because all history is written in the present moment, of allowing the present moment to overwhelmingly dictate your vision of the past. On the other hand, this idea that there's an <coughs> Olympian position from which one can write about the past which is unaffected by the contemporary is complete and utter nonsense. It does not exist. There is no such thing. Gibbon was a man of that time. Each of these historians was a man of his or her time. And that's, that's incontrovertible. And so I'm a person of my time and of the experiences I've been through, obviously. Um, that said, uh, I think that Palestine studies, which is a much newer field than Irish studies, um, is very much affected by the impact of the present moment. Um, I was just reading a review by John Reynolds of, Maynuth, of, of my book and of a book by Noura Aliqad, in which he points out that, that so much of the scholarship on Palestine was moved away from a settler colonial paradigm to a justice and reconciliation paradigm by the Oslo so-called peace process. It was not a peace process, it was a process which did not and was not designed to bring peace. It was a process designed to instantiate the present, make it permanent, and to create a process from which many people derived very profitable careers. But it was not a peace process. In any case, that present moment, I think, has affected Palestinian historiography. And I've been surprised as I've delved into, in my amateur way, into Irish history, uh, by the degree to which the troubles and then the, the, the Good Friday Agreement and the peace and reconciliation process in the North seem to have affected Irish historiography in the last 40 or so years, or 50 years, whatever. Um, very clearly, there has been an impact. And in both cases, I would suggest the impact was not entirely positive. Uh, in other words, I think that digging back and looking at the settler colonial in Palestine is absolutely essential to understanding anything, anytime. Um, even if we are moving towards peace and reconciliation, which at, at the present moment, obviously, in Palestine, we are not. But that's also true in Ireland. Because where you want to end up has to be derived from where you started, even if you are moving close to a positive 
just, equitable, decolonized end. Well, that's putting it mildly, I think, in terms of uh, Irish <coughs> historiography, but I know my uh, history colleagues are in the room with us, so they'll, they'll have something to say about that shortly. But look, I'm going to move into the, the fire pit now of, of what people, I think, will want to talk about. How do we situate Ireland and Palestine side by side in your analysis? Um, one of the things that strikes me about the way you manage uh, the Hundred Years history, and obviously you've gone back to much earlier periods, but in terms of the Hundred Years history, one of the things that's so striking, of course, is the chronological alignment of these watershed moments that you right. identify. So from the Balfour Declaration from 1917 through to the, the League of Nations mandate in 1922, everything that's happening in Palestine finds this curious skewed reflection, of course, in what's happening in Ireland with the move to independence from the 1916 rising through to the treaty and, and uh, the beginnings of the free state and so on. We are looking at some chronological parallels and we look at them again, I think, back in the early 1980s perhaps. Uh, so we've certainly got that sense of connection but it disguises all kinds of differences and deviations. And then of course, recently in the research that you're doing here, you're looking much more um, intimately at the methodologies of the colonial machinery that operated not only in Palestine but throughout the Middle East. And, and you talk about, uh, particularly in the 1930s, the British tactics of repression, the playbook of British colonial administration being the same as what operated in Ireland. Right. Uh, and you're also, of course, looking at the key connecting figures, Balfour himself being perhaps the primary one, though by no means the only one, Bloody Balfour, as he was known uh, here, and then a, a, a different incarnation uh, in uh, his later role. Um, so we've, we've got these parallels, we've got these connections. How aware are you of the sensitivities that this brings up in mm. an Irish landscape? Uh, probably not sufficiently. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't possibly be uh, sufficiently sensitive to these things because having dipped my toe into Irish historiography and Irish literature, uh, which is endless, vast, and, and, and incredibly dense, and, and, and in many cases so solid as work, um, I can't, po and, and, and having dipped my toe into the observing the politics, I couldn't possibly have a sufficient sensitivity um, to avoid the landmines I'm sure I'm stepping all over uh, with everything I write about this. Uh, nevertheless, um, I'm used to sensitivity. Uh, one can't say a word about Palestine without stepping on many, many very inflamed toes in the United States. So, you know, I'm used to it. Um, and I can take it, I hope. Um, but to get to the, to the, the nub of, of your question, um, the things that I've discovered as I've gone deeper into trying to examine this, these sets of parallels, are firstly that I think the settler colonial paradigm is insufficient to cover all of the cases that it purports to cover. That secondly, um, Irish history is probably incommensurate with any other settler colonial history because it is the first um, and the longest. You can't talk about something that's been going on in 800 years, for over 800 years with something that's been going on for just over 100 years. They're simply not commensurate. So there are those kinds of uh, there are there are those kinds of obstacles to any facile parallels. On the other hand, the deeper I delve into Irish history, the more I realize that everything that the British did everywhere they learned here first. Everything that the British did everywhere. They learned some things in Normandy, they learned some things in France during the Hundred Years' War, they learned some things in Scotland and in Wales, but almost everything they learned about colonizing, about settling, about controlling hostile majorities, about so many other techniques and, 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 and mindsets and attitudes, start here. I mean, I read 18th century history of Ireland and I could be reading Palestinian history. The words are the same, the terms are the same. The understanding of the other is the same. Uh, sometimes it's not exactly the same word. You use planter, you don't use, use settler. You use plantation, you don't use settlement. But it's the same. They're, they are, they are, 
mutandis, mutandi, obviously. They are the same kinds of phenomena in some respects. Um, and the closer one gets to the present, the more that's the case. The personnel of the British Empire is steeped in Ireland, not just Balfour. Half the generals are Anglo-Irish. Half the policemen are Anglo-Irish. Half the politicians are Irish peers, have estates in Ireland, have served in Ireland, and so on and so forth, or have spent a large chunk of their careers uh, dealing with Ireland in parliament and government, and so on and so forth. And so the people whom we grapple with, the Churchills and the Balfours, and then at a much lower level, the, the Ord Wingates and the Sir Charles Teagarts, have an Irish background to everything they do to us in Palestine. And then finally, just the last thing I'll say in answer to this question, you're absolutely right about that moment towards the end of World War I. Everything changes there. It's one of the, those moments when identity changes in, in the wake of traumatic experience, whether it's the, the Easter Rising or whether it's the Somme or whether it's World War I generally. Uh, everything changes. You, and, and, and Britain is confronting not just the Irish Revolution, not just the Bolshevik Revolution, a German Revolution, an Egyptian Revolution, an Indian Revolution, an Iraqi revolution, uh, a nationalist uprising in Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, and the refusal of the Persians to, to be quiescent. So Britain is dealing in a moment, some historical post-World War I moment, with all of these crises simultaneously, at the moment of its greatest geographical extension. The British Empire was never bigger than it was in the year or two after World War I, never in its entire history. And they were victorious in World War I. At the same time, they were bankrupt, their army was stretched thin, and the same politicians in London were dealing with eight or ten crises simultaneously. That's why Ireland wins, because it took advantage of Britain's, Britain's uh, 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 difficulty was Ireland's opportunity. It was also the opportunity of the Turks and the Persians and the Bolsheviks. Palestinians weren't so lucky. And some of the other peoples weren't so lucky. So uh, I think you're right in putting your finger on that moment. And I, I'm, I'm, I, I, uh, it's funny, it's the, it's the end of a phase of British colonialism in Ireland, which doesn't end completely, of course, but it's the end of the phase, and it's the beginning of the, of the, of the colonization with British support by the Zionist movement of Palestine. So it is a, it's a very important turning point. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to squeeze in one more question, which is with my literary hat on, because one of the things you're so attentive to in uh, 100 years and in previous books is the language mm. that has carried this story, mm. uh, whether it's you know, brilliant analysis of the language, even of the word home, in the Balfour Declaration, through to the kind of vocabulary that, as you've shown, carries across mm -hmm. from one colonial situation, etc., colonial situation to another. And we've discussed this uh, previously, Rashid. But I'm, I'm just going to ask you, before we open to questions, about how you see certain romanticisms and mythologies carried mm -hmm. from one situation to another. The narrative, for example, of unfinished business mm -hmm. that exists in Irish politics as it obviously exists in the Middle East. The narrative of intractability, that mm -hmm. these are conflicts that will always happen, that will always recur, that violence is inevitable, right. uh, that there won't be closure. How much are they playing into your field of vision and looking at parallels? Yeah, uh, another good question, Eve. Um, well, I think that, let, let me start from the end with this intractability uh, uh, concept. Um, if you start from the wrong place, you're going to end up in the wrong place. In other words, if one starts from assumptions about the Irish, or about Catholics and Protestants, or about Muslims and, and Jews, or about Arab nationalism and Zionism, or whatever it may be, um, and one uses that as the grounding of one's analysis, one is not going to end up in the right place. Um, I think that in, in both cases, difficult though it is for particularly the colonial side of this equation to accept it, one has to understand that colonial background. And one has to understand that part of the problem is decolonizing. And that has a threatening ring to it for those who are thereby branded as the colonists or the settlers or whatever it may be. And that makes it all the more difficult and all the more sensitive. But I think that if one doesn't use that framework of analysis, 
You can't get anywhere. Of course it's intractable. Protestants and Catholics, Arabs and Jews, they all never, blah, blah, blah. And, you, and, and a history is then, a false history is then created going back in this, com in this country before there even was a reformation. And in, and in the case of Palestine and the Middle East, long before there was any conflict between Arabs and Jews or Muslims and Jews to prove that, in fact, that's the, that's the real problem. And it's, of course, it's, there's no way to solve it. It's, it's something intrinsic in these people, whichever people you're talking about. So that aspect of it, I think, requires a kind of steely determination to insist on things that are inherently uncomfortable. Uh, you have populations that have been here four or five hundred years. They're not settlers. They're not settlers anymore. Uh, Mahmoud Mandani has a wonderful, wonderful book, uh, uh, Settlers into Natives, which many people have critiqued. But I think he's, he's, he's got an idea there, just with the very title. Um, it, it, there are very few titles like that that work that way. Um, and it works in, in that respect. Nevertheless, one has to go back and understand where this project came from, what it did, and, and how it has worked itself out throughout history. It was a settler colonial project. Does that mean that the Protestants in Northern Ireland are settlers? Of course not. They're natives. Does that mean that the Israelis are settlers? Well, some of them today in Hebron are. They are actually today stealing land, today cutting down olive trees, today expelling people from their property or their houses. Those are settlers. That's like Ulster and, you know, under Cromwell. But uh, are, are, well, Israelis, it's, permanently categorized as settlers and therefore excluded in a sense from you know circle of virtue? Of course not. There's no way to solve it that way. But to exclude the history, to ignore the history, means you ignore the only way to resolve this, which is to, to, to come to grips with what colonization, colonialism has done. And I think that that is a hard road to hoe for a historian, uh, and certainly for a policy analyst. It must be even harder. Um, I'm not a policy analyst. I mean, I'm not, I don't make policy. I just write history. And I hope I have an impact on the public, and maybe that will impact policy one day. Um, but there's no, in my view, there's no other way. He, he just writes history. You heard it here first. <laughs> let's, let's open this to questions. Uh, I don't think we're using the microphone, Francesca, because of, uh, of COVID at the moment. So please, if you have a question, if you raise your hand, and then perhaps you could... Uh, speak in as loud a voice as possible, and I'm going to just see. So I've got uh, a question towards the middle of the room, is it? Yeah. And, and no, we'll come back to that one. I've got Kieran at the back. Off you go. And if you wouldn't mind just saying your name or what, why you're here. Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Kieran Neal. I'm Deputy Director of the Hospital Story. And my question is about uh, the last section of your most recent book, which you sent the circus back to what you were talking being a sort of public, public intellectual, taking a public position on something. I mean, I was, I really enjoyed the book. I learned an awful lot from it. But there was this moment of transition at the very end where you were in a sort of controlled fury, in a sense. <laughs> and I wonder, and the question I want to ask you is, is there a before and after that for you as a historian? Do you think that moment of really taking quite explicit position, advocating advocating a program of potential development in the future and in the present. Do you think you go back to writing the same sort of history you wrote before? Or is there is that is this a new phase for you? Do you think it will intrinsically affect your next work as a historian? I'm just gonna summarize that here and if I may for, for people yeah, listening on Facebook. Uh, the, the last phase of the latest book where there's a, a change in tone and you are advocating for certain lines of development, let's say, does this change you as a historian? Can you go back to being just a historian after this moment? So is this a watershed for you, I suppose, the, the, the last book? Good question, Karen. Um, actually, I don't think it is. Um, Eve mentioned that several of my previous books were written for a general audience. And if you read them carefully, I don't think I, I, I'm quite as explicit in, in advocating outcomes uh, in most of them, as I am in this one. But if you read them carefully in several of them, I think I am. Um, I have a book on American, America in the Middle East, uh, Resurrecting Empire, which was written just before the Iraq War started and was published just after the Iraq War was launched, the, the 2003 war was launched. 
Um, and it's a, it's a, there's a lot of controlled fury in that, by the way, that book. Um, and I am actually advocating, but I, in a much more, I think, restrained way uh, than I am in the last chapter of this book. Let me just say something, however. I mean, I'm reading a lot of really fine history of Ireland. And anyone who thinks that Lecky or, or Froude or whoever the hell it is, uh, Leiden, was not advocating, uh, hasn't read very carefully. I mean, there's advocacy, or, or, or Roy Foster, or whoever it may be. There's, there's advocacy in every line of it. Uh, Seamus Dean famously deconstructed a, a, a sentence or two of, of, uh, of Roy's history, of Ireland, modern history of Ireland. Um, that was advocacy. It was impeccably objective history, of course. But it was advocacy, certainly, as is most history. I mean, Gibbon wasn't an advocate. So admittedly, I'm coming down off the historian's perch in that chapter. You're right and saying, you know, this is what I think I would hope might happen. Um, but I frankly think that that's the case in a lot of history. Thanks, Kieran. Luke, go ahead, as loud as you can. Hi, Richard. It's just um, an opposition that has come up in the last few decades about the Irish situation, but of course it applies to other situations as well. And this is that it's no longer about territory. It's about people. Mm. So. One of the mantras in debates in Ireland is that forget about land and territory. We're now shifting to kind of issues having to do with racism, multiculturalism, uh, tolerance, so on and so forth. And that shifts the axis onto people in, in a way that's kind of, if you like, dislocated in every sense of the word from the questions of territory and questions. And even other terms such as sovereignty are coming in for obviously a lot of criticism mm -hmm. in an age of internationalism and globalization. So could you say how much, I mean, in other words, if you, if you look at the African-American um, parallels, African-American parallels have little slavery and the body and individuals, but they're not strictly speaking about territory, they're not about right. land. Whereas if you look at Native American, right. which often slips through the nets of debates, it is about church. It right. is about land. It's not just about injuries to culture. It's about injuries to political terrain. Right. So could you say something that, that looking at the Irish interior you have been looking at, right. has it kind of helped to <coughs> illuminate or draw out some of the issues that the Palestinian-Israeli question is still about land and territory, and not just about getting on with your neighbor, and not just about right. Peace and reconciliation in a humanist sense. Thanks, Luke. I'm just going to summarise, if, if I can, uh, if I understand, Luke, that the conversation as you see it has now moved in many regards from being about territory to being about people, about sovereignty, and of course, a word that you you have to work with in, in such expansive terms, uh, Rashid, which is identity and, and the idea of the emergence, the concrete identity that, that begins to take shape as you see it. Palestine, even in the absence of uh, a state. Um, so how much are we now talking still about land and territory? How much about something else? Mm. Yeah, good question, Luke, again. They're all good questions. Um, I mean, I have to go back to the, to, the, to the idea that I've been hammering at, which is that in any settler colonial situation, it's, it's about both people and land. It has to be about demography and um, I mean, I'm reading that in the Irish history that I'm reading, and I know it's true in the Palestinian case. The Zionist movement was obsessively focused on both demography, increasing the numbers of the Jewish population of Palestine, and control of land. And the Palestinians were obsessed with the other side of this, retaining control of land and the issue of the, the, the demographic balance between the two peoples. Um, and the little I've read of Irish history indicates that that's always been the case here. Ch changing the demographic balance as much as possible, but especially control of land has always been important here. Now, I am completely unqualified to talk about how things may have changed here in the last few decades. Um, one of the things that I've mainly been doing is looking at the earlier periods, um, about which I know nothing, knew nothing um, of Irish history. Um, I see what you're talking about, I think, however. 
And I think that it's part of a shift, or it may be linked to a shift, which I can talk about in the Palestinian case, where in the Palestinian case, many people are saying the route to decolonization is not two states side by side, but rather a decolonized uh, uh, state in which all citizens would have equal rights, in which the focus is again on people rather than on territory. Now, whether that's a realistic outcome in the Palestinian-Israeli case, I do not know, and I'm not saying right now. But there has been that shift for some people in looking at Palestine, both analysts and politicians and ordinary Palestinians, and Israelis, for that matter, um, interestingly, on both ends of the Israeli political spectrum. Um, now, here, I, I wouldn't feel qualified to speak to that, but it, it does seem that de-emphasizing some of the aspects of the history in favor of a kind of touchy-feely reconciliation approach may or may not lead to something, but it certainly obscures some deeper problems that sooner or later have to be addressed. Um, I, I, I don't want to pronounce myself because I'm very interested by the way in which this country 32 counties, this country will evolve um, in terms of those issues. I, I don't know that you will blaze the path for others, but I have, a, I have a sense that there are things that may happen or could happen or are in people's minds that might be of use to others, including Palestinians and Israelis. I don't know. I mean, it'll depend on how the thing works. It depends on the elections and then here and there. It depends on the bloody Brits and Brexit and the Tory party and their complete blindness to Ireland and so on and so forth. But, uh, I'm sorry if anyone's offended. <laughs> I can't help it. You know. <laughs> I learned a great deal about Balfour at a conference at Notre Dame that Seamus Dean organized on um, uh, Ireland, India, Palestine, partition and memory. When I gave a talk on Balfour, which I focused entirely on Palestine, ignorant at the time of his, of his background here, of course, and Seamus came up to me and said, oh, the audience loved it. I said, yes, they really did. I, was, I didn't realize they were that interested in positive. He said, no, it's bloody Balfour. <laughs> and I, I learned then about the man's background here um, and learned much more since then. Um, so uh, uh, I don't know why I mentioned that. Because he's one of our more popular historical yeah, figures. The, the Brits. We have the same attitude towards him that the, the Irish do. That's what uh, I was trying to say. I'll come back if we have time to this question of, of identity and people, but we have a question at the, at the front, please. Um, I, I want to ask a question about the apples and oranges and, and what can be comparable and not comparable. Mm. What I think is so interesting in, in the project you've led here is comparing two cases that perhaps we tend to think of belonging to different regions altogether. And so my question is, is the historical field ready to carry out, to accept the comparability of these two cases? Mm -hmm. And have you faced resistances in the field for bringing the Irish settler colonial and the Palestinian settler colonial experience together? Mm -hmm. But you trace that link really well by saying, in the text, the English language, the English strategy is, is the same. So I would be remiss if I didn't bring a bit of North Africa into mm -hmm. the equation and say, across colonial powers, what France is doing in Algeria, do you see there also the potential for comparison? Or is that beyond? <coughs> I, I'm going to beautifully, uh, beautifully put question, are we ready for this kind of analogy? Uh, what kind of resistance are you facing? But then, of course, the bigger horizon, and it's on my own notes as well. Surely, the kind of laboratory methods that you have identified are also taking place across North Africa, uh, under the French administration and under many other colonizing administrations. Right. Um, do you risk limiting and reducing this discussion uh, to, to, to the British-Irish binary and, and damaging that wider picture? I hope I haven't hijacked your question, but, yeah. but a very, very good one. Um, thanks for the question, please. Um, firstly, I haven't yet gotten pushback because I haven't published anything. So, so far, so good. Uh, secondly, I do recognize the limitations of the settler colonial paradigm. And I, in fact, I've learned more about those limitations as I've worked on this project. Uh, thirdly, um, I do consider other cases, uh, North America and, 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 and Algeria in particular. 
and I want to con consider them at least superficially, continue to consider them at least superficially. Um, it, it's a source to, of, 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 of puzzlement to me <coughs> that in the discourse on settler colonialism, which tends to be either grounded in North America or Australia or South Africa or Algeria, there's so little reference to Ireland. Now, is this because it's a European white Christian country? Is this because it's so much earlier than any of the other cases? I mean, they, they're at it here for 400 years before they go to North America. Well, yeah, more than 400 years. Uh, the, the British, the English. Uh, is it because Ireland becomes independent at the end of the First World War and decolonization takes place, by and large, at the end of the Second World War? And so the case falls out of people's minds, the Irish case. Um, Third world revolutionaries and nationalists were aware of the Irish example all over everywhere in the 1880s and 90s, in the first decades of the 20th century, and afterwards. But in the, the literature on settler colonialism, it just doesn't exist almost, which to my, it, it puzzles me a little bit, and I, I've suggested what some of the reasons might be. Um, I, I do have to continue to stress the incom incommensurability of each of these cases with one another. Um, and there is a difference between French settler colonialism, for example, and British. But there are a lot of typologies in British settler colonialism which involve continuities from Ireland through North America and the Caribbean through Africa uh, later on. And I think those are, and, and, and in British colonial practice generally, and I think those are incontestable, frankly. Um, they can be, however, applied to, to North Africa. I think, as well, and to, and to colonialism generally, European colonialism generally, I think. I'll, I'll find out. I mean, I'm at the beginning of a, of a long journey, I think. Indeed, and of course, many uh, uh, historians, General Hassett and others, are working on this as we speak. So mm -hmm. uh, obviously, this is a wider conversation that is developing. Mm -hmm. I've got a question at the back, please. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. I'm very interested in this comparison, being an Israeli pro-Palestinian you. My name is Ronnie Clanton. And um, I want to ask you, though, in relation to what Danny's um, talk about settlers becoming natives and Rife's uh, uh, response to it, which I'm sure you know. Whose response? Rife. Oh, like, yes, yes, I've read it. Uh, yes, yes, of course. You know, is, it, is there a huge difference in the Jews, the Israeli Jews, feeling that this they are in fact the indigenous people of Palestine, which is spurious. I do agree with with the, with the settler colonial uh, paradigm, more or less. I mean, with, with but is there a difference there in that the Zionism is a different settler colonial uh, enterprise Absolutely. than Ireland and, and even others, Algeria, South Absolutely. Africa, and so on and so forth? Absolutely. You Thank you, Ronit. Uh, and are we talking about a different constituency in the nature of, of Zionism as settler colonialism? Uh, and I think, again, a really pertinent question, you spend a lot of time uh, on Zionism and, and the particular evolution of Zionism right. in the latest book and in previous books, right. um, but perhaps not necessarily a reading that, that everybody will agree with. Right. And just to add a footnote to that, I think you also do point out that Palestinian identity, as you understand it, is not simply formed in antithesis to Zionism itself, that it's, it's part of that whole network of, of what's happening in Syria, in Jordan, in Lebanon, and in terms of British and American narratives. But this particular relationship, surely we've now reached the kernel of, of what people are interested in in your work, and, and perhaps the area of greatest sensitivity. Right. Where does Zionism sit in your analysis? Right. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for that excellent question. Um, I try and make very clear early on in what I'm working on that even though Zionism fits, in my view, into the settler colonial category in some way, um, and in fact saw itself in those terms for the first many decades of its existence, uh, Herzl, Jabotinsky, every major figure wrote privately or publicly about it as a settler colony. They, they talked about the idea that the land belonged to the Jewish people. They talked about the historic link. They saw themselves in national terms, but they also saw themselves 
unabashedly, unashamedly, frankly and bluntly, in a settler colonial mode. They understood that, they said it, they weren't ashamed. The Jewish colonization agency is not some anti-Semitic smear. It's a major institution of land purchase in Palestine for decades. I didn't call it colonization, they called it colonization. So that part is, is, is uh, I think, uh, uncontrovertible. However, Zionism is completely different from every other settler colonial project I've ever studied in that it is not an extension of the population of the mother country. The French send French people, or people whom they Frenchify, Maltese and Portuguese and Spaniards and Italians, to North Africa to be part of the French Republic, or the monarchy first and then the Republic. Uh, England sends out English and Welsh and Scottish and so forth settlers, and in many cases Irish settlers, to North America to be an extension of the, of the territories of the crown. Maryland is named for Queen Mary, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, Carolinas are named for Charles. They're an extension of English sovereignty and of England ab abroad. Uh, and they're different in that respect from other kinds of colonies where you don't have settlers. Uh, they're an extension of the mother country. Zionism is an independent project, comes under the wing of British imperialism, would not succeed without British imperialism, uh, has a settler colonial nature, but it's also a national project. And, and among other things, a very successful public relations project, a very successful financial project, a very successful military project. Uh, but it is not, in, 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 given all of those uh, uh, factors, in any way similar to other settler colonial endeavors. It's completely different in that respect. It's a national project. I mean, Herzl isn't going there to do a favor to, the, to the, the, the Ottoman Sultan, whom he romances, or the German Kaiser. Uh, and, and, and Weizmann is not trying to do a favor to the British Empire in the first instance, though he hopes that he will. He's going to do a favor to the Jewish people as he sees it. It's a national project. So it's, it has that, it has that which, which is not true of, of most other settler colonial projects. And some of them take on a national dimension. The Americans are revolting, revolt against the crown, and they become a national project. The, uh, Rhodesia, a unilateral de declaration of independence by, uh, uh, what's his name, Smith, uh, is another case. The, 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 the settlers in the Colon in Algeria revolt against the Gaul when he tries to, to, to sell them out as they see it. So sometimes settlers turn against the mother country, but in every one of those cases, those were extensions of the mother country. The Zionists were not, never were. It's a completely, in that respect, it's a completely different uh, phenomenon. And just, if I may add on to that quickly. And in others, obviously. What are you going to do, Rashid, about the voices that aren't going to fit into your template? I'm thinking particularly of uh, the Second World War mandate era, where mm -hmm. you've got a number of British administrators who are not part of this aristocratic or Anglo-Irish uh, confederacy that you've identified, um, who are both Zionist, small Z, who are watching uh, the, the situation with, with Eastern European refugees, changing the landscape of Israel, as it is going to become, and at the same time are pro-Irish nationalism. Yeah. I don't know how I'm going to fit that in. <laughs> uh, the easier bit is to follow practices and personnel who start in Ireland, go to Palestine and other parts of the empire, develop techniques there, and then end up back in Northern Ireland. That's a thread that's easy to follow. But those who served empire but were nationalist, Irish nationalists, they, they're going to be harder for me to understand and figure out. And as, as I mentioned in response to Luke's question, uh, I, am yet, I have yet to, to, to get to the modern era of Irish history, which is, has its own complexities that I haven't even begun to, 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 to grapple with. Um, I'm trying to get a hold of the earlier which I know so much less about. I, I'm sure you're right. I will have a problem there. <laughs> no, it all gets easier. On, we have time for a final question here at the front, please. Um, I'm the ambassador of Pakistan in Ireland, uh, and I'll make a little bit shift. Uh, I'll make a little bit shift. Sorry, would you mind introducing yourself yes, again? Yes, my name is uh, Dr. Gilan Wahba. I'm the Palestinian ambassador to Ireland. Um, I'll make a little shift from talking about the settler and colonizations, and I want to ask the questions about uh, Madrid to Oslo. To Oslo. Mm -hmm. uh, you were the advisor of the Palestinian delegations uh, during the Madrid conference, and then you talk about uh, Oslo, and it was not a peace process, it's a process. I wanted to see 
what was missing mm. between uh, Madrid and Oslo? Mm. And how do you see with this complication that's going on now in Palestine, uh, whether it's uh, on a local level or international, regional level, and um, if there is any kind of horizon mm -hmm. for a solution? This is a good good question to draw us to a, a close. Ambassador, thank you for joining us. You've referred to what Rashid talked about earlier, his experience of being at the negotiating table in the early 90s, uh, both in Madrid and then towards the Oslo agreements. And I think you write of your frustration at the idea that uh, people were not listening, James Baker and so on at the time. They were simply not listening. Things obviously didn't happen then that might have happened. If we translate that arena into contemporary circumstances, what needs to change now? How does this move forward? This is pushing you back into the advocacy role right. that Kieran O'Neill mentioned at the very beginning, and I don't know how willing you are to talk about what you think politically sh should happen now, Rashid, um, but, uh, but let's see. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, that question. Um, it's a good ending <laughs> for us this morning or this afternoon. Um, I, I, would, I, would, I would really be happy to talk about what went wrong between Madrid, our negotiations in Washington, and what other people then did at Oslo and afterwards. Um, I actually have written a book about that. It's called Brokers of Deceit. I don't know if it's available in Ireland, in which I discuss what I think went wrong. I touch on it in this book, uh, in, a chap in one of the last chapters. Very briefly, I mean, it's, it's, uh, having written a book on it, it's hard to summarize, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Uh, very briefly, I will read it. Inshallah, I hope so. Um, very briefly, uh, I think that, that what was lacking was an understanding on the part of the Americans that if they were to come to a, res a real resolution, they would have to treat the Palestinians on a level of equality with the Israelis, which meant that they had to have the same rights, which meant that there could not be the kind of structural inequality built into the negotiation by the Americans and the Israelis in order to produce an unequal outcome. And I, I, Bush and Baker obviously did not have that view, nor did Clinton and his two mediocre secretaries of state uh, have that view. Um, and of course, in my view, neither did the Israeli leaders. Even Rabin, who accepted the idea that the Palestinians are, the, are a people for the first time uh, for any Israeli leader, who accepted to negotiate with the PLO, first time for any Israeli leader, did not accept that the Palestinians had a right to sovereignty, statehood, or self-determination. He said it explicitly in a speech because he, before he was assassinated for going too far in doing what he did do. So you had neither on the American side nor on the Israeli side the minimum necessary to have a just and equitable, I won't say just and equitable, to have a solution that would have involved two states. That was completely ruled out. I argue in my book that that goes back to accepting a framework laid down by Menachem Begin in the earlier Camp David negotiations in 1978. That is the structure we have in Palestine today. Begin's autonomy, designed to establish exclusive Israeli sovereignty, the exclusive Israeli right to settle anywhere, always, without hindrance, and complete Israeli security control is what was implemented at Oslo and is what we have now. Now, how do you deal with that in the 21st century? You have to dismantle it. You have to dismantle this, the roots of it, which are, as I, I suggested, are settler colonial roots. And by dismantle, I don't mean destroy. I mean you have to understand how to decolonize. Now, decolonization can be done in many ways. It has been done violently, and it has been done peacefully. It has been done over a very short period of time, and it is still, in my view, under, 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 underway in this country. Um, at the moment, kind of that fortunately, peacefully. Um, but it has to happen. And then the structures that have been built up since Oslo, in my view, have to be dismantled. They were designed to give us the outcome we have today. Unlimited settlement, one sovereignty, one security authority, one state. That's all there is in Palestine now. That's all this structure can ever, ever produce. It cannot and will not produce Palestinian self-determination, sovereignty or statehood. It cannot produce, in my view, anything just or equitable or fair or sustainable. This is a recipe for continued unending conflict, which is, I think, what the Israeli leaders 
accept it. I mean, you, you can find quotes from Diane and Rabin saying, this is what we're stuck with. We're going to have to fight them forever. So be it. That is the mindset behind this. And you can read this in Irish history, going back to <laughs> Strongbow, <laughs> right up to the people in the castle in 1920 and 21. We're going to have to fight them forever. It doesn't matter. We have to keep going. And that mindset obviously is incompatible with any resolution that's just and, uh, and sustainable. I'm, I'm really <laughs> Thank you, Rashid. I'm really sorry that we, we uh, time has run out, and we're going to have to bring this to a close. But obviously, we are living, uh, watching an unfinished history. To go back to our earlier discussion, uh, and Rashid, your research is unfinished. I hope very much that you will come back. Uh, when it is complete, or as complete as it can be, and, and talk to us again. I want to thank everybody for joining us for their questions, uh, to thank those of us, those of you who've joined on Facebook. Uh, but most of all, Rashid, thank you very, very much for your candor and your integrity in talking to us about your work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.